Hi everyone, and welcome to the second episode of RMIT's Technology Matters series. Today, we'll be exploring what's next in the future of health and social care. Uh, I'm Dean Chichi, the Executive Director of Students here at RMIT University. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Wurrung and Boonarung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely in these times, I want to also pay my respects to the wider unceded lands of this nation. Like many sectors, healthcare is entering a period of rapid change. New technologies are fundamentally changing how we prevent, diagnose and treat diseases, as well as the relationship between medical professionals and patients. Already, healthcare has changed in ways that we could not have imagined 20 years ago. We now have wearable tech uh, devices that track our sleep patterns and heart rate. We have bio printers that can be used to print human body parts. And we have drones that deliver urgent medical supplies in developing countries. To better understand what's next for health and social care, We've assembled an expert group of RMIT researchers, academics and industry professionals working at the intersection of health and technology. So let's meet the members of our panel today. First up, we have Professor Milan Brandt, who is the Technical Director of RMIT's Advanced Manufacturing Precinct. He is the leading Australian researcher in the area of macro machining with lasers and has a number of patents, research papers and commercial products to his name. Milan is the lead researcher on a five year project that combines 3D printing, robotic surgery and advanced manufacturing to create custom made implants for patients with bone cancer. He has also led research into Australia's first locally made 3D printed spinal implant, which was successfully delivered to a patient in 2015. In 2019, Engineers Australia named Milan a centenary hero for the impact of his work. Welcome Milan. Next up, we have Associate Professor Kate Fox. Kate is a biomedical engineer and the Associate Dean for Higher Degrees by Research in the School of Engineering. Prior to joining RMIT, Kate was part of the Bionic Eye Project, which worked to develop a diamond electrode capable of electrically stimulating retinal tissue. Recently uh, included in the Engineers Australia's top 30 most innovative uh, engineers list, Kate is also the recipient of a Victorian Tall Poppy Award and recognised by Science and Technology Australia as a superstar of STEM. Lovely to have you with us today, Kate. Finally, we have Professor Vishal Kishore, Vishal is a professor of innovation and public policy at RMIT, where he works on major healthcare and urban innovation initiatives. He also leads the RMIT Cisco Health Transformation Lab, which brings together design, systems thinking and technology to reshape health. He regularly advises governments, NGOs and corporates in matters of public policy, strategy and innovation. Welcome Vishal. Okay, so today you have the opportunity to submit questions uh, to our speakers by entering them into the question panel on the right of your screens. Feel free to send these through at any time during the event and we'll do our best to address them at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email with the slides after the event. And don't forget to use our hashtag RMI Tech Matters if you are watching. Okay, let's get into the discussion. Uh, the World Health Organization has designated 2020 the year of the nurse and midwife. And as we speak, nurses everywhere are working at the front line of our battle against coronavirus pandemic, demonstrating just how indispensable they truly are. The WHO has estimated that we need a further 9 million nurses and midwives around the world uh, if we are to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. Vishal, turning to you, this first question's for you. How do you think new and emerging technologies will affect the role of nurses in our communities? Uh, thank you, Dean, and, and welcome to everybody. It's, it's so lovely to spend some time together. I, I think it's a really great question, Dean, and I think, um, you're, I mean, to start with, you're completely right, aren't you, that we've, we've 
we're recognizing again, though we should never have forgotten, just quite how um, quite the superheroes that we have on the front line of our health system, um, the nurses, um, the clinicians, but not just those, also a, a series of other ancillary and associated players without whom our system just wouldn't work at all. So it, it's, it's, I'm so pleased that you, uh, that you started with this. And I think it's, I think um, particularly in this moment, we should all just take a moment to, uh, to just congratulate and to thank those people who are day after day, uh, shift after shift, putting themselves on the line um, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep us well and to keep us safe and to get us back uh, to well-being. Um, but you're, you're also completely right to say um, uh, there are certain dynamics in our healthcare system that are really being shown up by, by the coronavirus pandemic. Things perhaps, again, that we should have known before, but that we're being reminded of. Um, uh, think of uh, new technologies for things like telehealth and indeed even more than that, virtualized care. Um, you could think about the tracking and tracing uh, apps that are currently being used. You could think about AI tools that are being used to help us to um, make decisions to understand risk and, and, to, and, and to, to strategize at individual and population levels. I think what all of this tells us is that the nursing profession of the future is going to have to continually be able to navigate and adapt to these new technologies. It's fundamentally going to change models of care. Um, it's going to change practices of care. It's going to change the skill mix that we need in our healthcare professionals on the front line in really radical ways. But I think that, um, so in a sense, uh, something that we talk about a lot is cybernetic healthcare, that merging of the human and the technological in health. And I think this pandemic is really showing that uh, to us in a new light and in a in a really uh, new way. However, I think there's one thing that amongst all of this fantastic technology and all of these emerging ideas, we need to be mindful of just one thing. It's possible to fetishize technology, isn't it? It's possible to, to imagine that if we just had the new piece of tech, we're all gonna be well and healthy and health systems are gonna work beautifully and we're all gonna be making fantastic decisions. And I think part of what this pandemic is showing us is the irreducibly human nature of our care workforces and the skills that they have. Um, technology alone is, is, is not enough. It's that irreducibly human skills that our nurses and our care professionals and our clinicians uh, are going to need to have to really help us to bring this cybernetic future of health forward. So at the same time as we help people to navigate uh, this technology in a different way and understand how to use it and deploy it in different ways, at the same time, we have to double down on those human skills. So it's a tall order, uh, but um, I think it's an exciting time for us to rethink the settlement between technology and human uh, in our healthcare systems. Dean? Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. I love this idea of cybernetic healthcare. I wonder if there's a Netflix series in that that I could binge watch over the long <laughs> <There> <laughs> Anyway, <is. laughs> um, um, Around 1,600 Australians are currently waitlisted for an organ transplant um, and a further 12,000 are on dialysis, many of whom would benefit from a kidney transplant. Turning now to Kate, how could technology help to alleviate some of these pressures on our healthcare system? Thanks, Dean. Um, yeah, th thanks, Dean. So, with the, the, I guess, the progression of healthcare of late, you know, technology is really starting to come to the fore. And the first thing we all think about when we look at organs is how do we how do we replace organs that simply are just aren't there? You know, people are very uncomfortable about having transplants from, you know, animal models that aren't human, but I guess all the technology we see when we're binge watching Netflix and when we're looking out there into science fiction is that we see all this stuff about 3D printing. And the cool thing is, is that a lot of work is now going into, can we use all these cool 3D printing technologies that have been developed for other industries in medical applications? And I guess we refer to it as biofabrication. And what that is, it's, it's a layer by layer technique where we can sort of co-print kidney cells or any other biological cells, but within a biomaterial to try and give it some shape. So I, I guess to address the problem of, of kidney transplants, the technology is coming. I'm, I'm not going to say it's there. A lot of universities, including RMIT, are spending a lot of time 
looking into the ways to um, manufacture synthetic um, replicas of kidneys using patients' own cells, using cells you know, developed in the lab. But the limitations really around the complexity of the problem. So biomanufacturing, really cool. We can make um, scaffolds to support ears. We can make skin. We can make things that are hollow. Really the simple um, structures in the body. And that, that's working really well. There's plenty of evidence for um, tissue implants that have been made in the lab. But when we come to kidneys, really we can make we can make a simple kidney, you know, one input, one output. It really comes down to the fact that the way kidneys are made in the lab, if we're 3D printing, the resolution, the complexity isn't quite there yet. But I can tell you the technology is rapidly improving. Um, give it a few years. You know, Harvard is well and truly down the track. They can make you know, all the tubes within the, the kidneys and a little bit of blood vessels. Um, but what they're really doing is trying to find ways to be able to get kidney cells inside other materials and then implant them into the person and hope that the kidney cells will you know, you know, duplicate and grow a, I guess, a more functional kidney over time. But really at the moment, it, it's simple structures for manufacturing. Um, but they're certainly trying, you know. If you asked me 20 years ago, could we make a kidney in a dish? I would have laughed at you. Ask me in 20 years and I'm sure we've done it. Next thing. Thank you, Kate. That just blows my mind, the whole idea that you can, you can um, bifabricate a, a human organ. That's just fascinating. Um, thank you for that. Turning over to Milan, um, personalised medicine uh, is already a part of our healthcare system. When a doctor uses family uh, history or past medical results to make treatment decisions, that is already a kind of personalised uh, medicine. So Milan, how is technology enabling tailored healthcare solutions for every individual rather than a one size fits all approach? Hi Dean and hi everybody and, uh, and welcome to this uh, webinar. So um, as Kate mentioned, I mean RMIT has got a facility called Advanced Manufacturing Precinct, uh, which is one of the leading facilities for 3D printing um, of, of objects. And we work with a lot of industry, uh, aerospace and you know, biomedical mining industry and in trying to uh, develop new products and processes for, for, uh, for, for these um, uh, companies. But uh, we recognize the benefits of 3D printing uh, for basically medical implants. And we started a project about eight years ago uh, to manufacture new generation of medical implants that would be very much patient specific and sort of bone specific. And we partnered with um, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, so with Professor Peter Chung, who is one of the leading orthopedic surgeons in Australia, and, and um, more recently companies like Stryker, where we're developing this, uh, this technology, which we sort of hope to um, translate into, into the Australian environment and obviously globally. So for the audience benefit of i uh, got a few slides just to sort of show some of this technology and where where things are going. So perhaps um, yeah, if slide one is on, I think slide one is on. So uh, the slide just illustrates uh, the number of cancer um, uh, cases in, in, in Australia. And you're looking at about 130, 140,000. Um, now about 60% of those will spread to the bone and about 10% of those will require surgical uh, intervention. So uh, what I've highlighted on the right and, and it's, it's circle is really where these bone cancers tend to occur. So the majority of them occur around your knee area. Um, and in the past, what's used to happen is surgeons would basically amputate, uh, you know, amputate uh, a person's leg. Um, and these days, the objective is to very much uh, salvage these limbs. So perhaps if we go to the next slide. So um, in the past, um, and to some degree it's still current, there's really a lot of, uh, there's lack of customization. So these implants, uh, which you can see on the right hand side, is in, highlighted in white. Uh, basically, they're solid implants. They're usually made from titanium. 
Um, and during operation, there's significant amount of tissue that's been removed, um, which then obviously uh, results in significant recovery time for the for the patient. Uh, however, one of the major issues with sort of uh, solid implants is this um, um, phenomena called stress shielding. Um, as the implants tend to be much stronger than the bone, then the bones uh, in in time, the uh, the weight is taken by the implant and bond around the implant starts to dissolve. So, um, then the patient has to undergo another surgery, maybe in 15, 20 years time to, um, uh, to repair that. So, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so what RMIT team has been working over the last uh, eight years is developing what we call lattice-based uh, uh, implants, and you can see an image on the on the left of, of, of the slide. Uh, these are sort of hollow structures um, as opposed to solid implants, um, but you can design them in such a such a way that they carry um, a significant load. Uh, so load bearing structures um, and we are then trying to adopt these structures for um, people with bone cancers. And as you mentioned, Dean, earlier, we, we partnered in around 2015 with a company called Anatomics who approached us to sort of adopt our technology for a patient they had with a spinal um, a defect. And we developed this uh, implant um, that you can see on the right. Uh, it's a model of a sort of spine with our implant, and that went into the patient in 2015. And the lady is now walking, and uh, and it's got a uh, she's got a normal uh, normal life. So if I go to the next slide, so in 20, around 2017 we were approached by Stryker. It's a Stryker is a leading uh, orthopedic company, global company. Um, and they were interested in in the work we're doing on lattices, uh, but they wanted to combine lattices with with uh, sort of robotic surgery. So, on the top right hand side, you can see a model bone with a lattice implant. So, uh, surgeons these days, because of the nature of the cutting tools, they tend to do straight cuts. Right? And in a lot of the cases, they remove too much of the bone, for example. So, what we are working on in, in the project with Stryker and that's supported through um, Innovative Manufacturing CRC uh, is to develop, uh, to combine the robotic surgery and, and our lattice uh, implants. So you can see on the image at the bottom right hand corner where sort of robot would do a uh, what we call a conformal cut. So try to uh, remove as little of the tumour Sorry, as much of the tumor, but as little of the healthy bone as possible, so that uh, you know the patient recovers much, much faster. Um, yes, so that's I guess gives people an idea of where this technology is going. And I, and I think you're looking at you know certainly in the short term, maybe three to five years for this technology to be uh, to be um, rolled out in in the community. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Milan. Now remember, you can ask a question of any of our experts during this webinar. Uh, simply add a question to the Q&A um, uh, icon uh, to the right of your screen. Also, if you hear anything today that uh, inspires you or, or you think is worth sharing, by all means, uh, take to Twitter and share using the hashtag RMI Tech Matters. OK, turning now from robotic surgery and titanium, let's talk diamonds. Uh, now, diamonds are my best friend, and, and sometimes we think about diamonds as being things that we wear outside of our bodies. Uh, but Kate, talk me through what might be some of the potential future uses of diamonds in medicine. Thanks, Dean. Well, I, I, as another famous blonde, I'm almost blonde, I, I say I'm blonde sometimes, once said, you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend, and there's no reason why we can't make it the uh, best friend of medical technologies. So the cool thing about diamond is up until now, it really hasn't um, come across people's minds about, a, a, I guess, a, a material that can go inside the body. And that's purely because we all think of it as you know, a really hard material that's sitting on our fingers that's really expensive. But what we've found actually is that diamonds are really interesting because it's made out of a carbon, which is obviously a really common element that's already floating throughout our body. Putting it inside the body, um, once you work out the manufacturing techniques is actually a really good thing 
So it, it really found its its um, emphasis in Australia um, back when we were working on the Bionic Eye project where we found that diamond could be made both conductive and insulating, similar to what you see inside a, you know, a TV set with all the LEDs. So we were able to use that to be able to put you know, stimulating electrodes through the diamond material and then use that inside the eye. But then since then, we've been uh, looking at new ways that we can combine it into medicine. And that's where sort of 3D printing and, and RMIT's expertise sort of came in because we, we found out that we can take the diamond as either a coating material or even find cool ways to sort of 3D print it. And when we exposed that to you know, biological cells and that sort of stuff, the diamond had this weird effect where the cells seemed to really like it. So all the bone cells and the, um, you know, the fibroblast cells, but the, I guess the bacteria really didn't like it. So it sort of, asked, sort of brought all these questions to the floor of you know, how far can we take diamonds um, for not only 3D printed bone implants, but also around wound healing. So adding it to much more softer structures and being able to, I guess, encourage wound healing, but also use the other cool um, element of diamond, which is that it's fluorescent under certain lights, which means that if we put it inside the body or in the wound, we're able to track how that biomaterial is being resorbed, where that diamond is going throughout the body. And it's a really cool thing, both in a nanomaterial or a thin film coating or a solid material, we're finding wonderful new ways to use it almost every day. It's cool. That is indeed cool. Thank you very much, Kate. I think it brings me meaning to her eyes sparkled like diamonds. <laughs> Shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. Thank you, Sia. Okay. <laughs> Um, we've gone from titanium to shining bright like a diamond. Will Vishal talk about chandeliers? I do not know. Stay tuned. Uh, Vishal, uh, this year RMIT and uh, Cisco together launched the Game Changing Health Transformation Lab. Can you tell us a little bit about what the lab does and why is it different to what other research labs have done to date? Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Dean. And um, I think when we launched the lab, we were in fact swinging from the chandeliers with excitement and joy. That's it. Yeah. So I got it in there. Um, so, um, uh, so the Health Transformation Lab is a really interesting intervention in the Australian healthcare scene. Um, uh, so, for example, if you if we were all in uh, in the United States or if we were in the UK and we were trying to figure out where to go for the next set of ideas that are going to mark out the future of healthcare or of health innovation. I would roughly know where to take you in each of those jurisdictions. I would kind of know where we should go and, you know, who was doing the cool work and where it was coming, um, particularly in the in the public policy domain and in the kind of the, the systems thinking in, in respect of health. One of the things that, my, that that we realize in in Australia is that there are some fantastic people doing brilliant work in, in health systems thinking, but um, there's there are very few um, focal points for us to go to. Um, in in a uh, in a sense, it's not as clear where to go for the best thinking in systems. If I'm a leader in the healthcare system, where do I go? If I'm a clinician, where do I go? If I'm a public policymaker, where do I go? And having been a, a, a policy a public policy person in the Victorian government, I found this very very clearly. I just didn't know where to go for this kind of thinking. So uh, the Health Transformation Lab aims to solve that problem in a sense. It aims to be a new home for where leaders come from health and beyond to solve some of their thorniest challenges in respect of the relationship between technology and human and today and tomorrow uh, in healthcare. So we do, we produce, uh, we, we basically say that we do three things. We pull together new communities of people who are interested in health innovation and transformation. And, and Kate Milan, uh, and uh, I would love for you to come and spend some time with us in the lab and, and talk to some of our communities about some of the fantastic work that you're doing. You are literally making cybernetic health people all over the place. You're making cyborgs, so we definitely want to talk to you. Um, so we bring new communities together. We feed those new communities with kind of subversive and anti-disciplinary and purposefully provocative ideas um, uh, at the boundary line uh, of disciplines, at the boundary line of existing practices. And then we do applied innovation work with, uh, you know, with Australia Post, with Vic Health, with Ramsey Healthcare, with Cisco to try to 
actually push new action in the healthcare system. And that in turn makes new communities and new insights. And we we produce this upward cycle. So we're, we're very applied, we're very provocative. And if anybody walks into our lab and says, oh, I'm a I'm an engineer or I'm an economist or I'm a lawyer. We say, please leave and tell us what you're interested in. Don't tell us what discipline you come from. So that's kind of the um, uh, where we're going. And you see some of these models, uh, Dean. Uh, it's kind of some of this model uh, is kind of inspired by what you see at MIT in the media lab. So they're really interested in the technologies that are going to reshape the world in the next originally 30 years, but increasingly shorter timeframes. And, and we're, we're kind of interested in the ideas that are going to, and the problems that are going to re, um, they're going to challenge us in our healthcare systems in the next 10 years. So we, we love the technology, but we're always focused on the problem in the healthcare system that we're trying to solve. So it's really exciting. It's extremely cool. Um, it's, it doesn't hurt that we've got fantastic technology from Cisco um, uh, to, to help us out. But as a result of uh, of of their support and their technology, we've been able to do some really remarkable things in the context of COVID-19. We've been able to incubate unbelievable technologies like wearables for loneliness or um, chair uh, or virtual reality chairs that are repurposed towards helping people recover from dementia um, or you know, thought experiments in off-world healthcare and what would that mean for healthcare on this planet right now? So we're, we are we want to be the home for crazy thinking um, and making that uh, make sense and do work in the healthcare system. So everyone's welcome to come and play with us. Fantastic, thank you, Vishal. Crazy creative thinking, that's what we love to hear. Okay, let's turn to some questions uh, from our audience. Um, let's focus, so our first question is about robotic surgery, and this is a question for you, Milan. Um, what are some of the other ways, uh, and you've explained uh, one way that uh, robotic surgery is being used, what are some of the other ways that robotic surgery uh, could be used? Yeah, thanks, Dean. Um, look, robotic surgery is 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 growing in importance, um, and um, it's currently used in a number of areas, but certainly for you know knee replacements. I mean, it's very very common for orthopedic surgeons to use uh, to use robots um, in relation with their implants. Uh, I think they're also in some really tricky, tricky parts of the body where people are now using robotic surgery instead of, you know, more conventional. So it is growing uh, and I, I, because it is also personalized in that sense, uh, it's more accurate um, than, than sort of uh, some of the conventional surgery. Uh, but yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Milan. OK, the next question from our listeners is from Kate. You ready for this one, Kate? Can you please describe what studies I would need to uh, pursue if I wanted to merge medicine and technology to solve real life problems? So in terms of becoming, I guess, in this field, there's actually no there's no one right way to go. So I have an engineering degree, I have a science degree and I have a law degree and <laughs> they're purely because they interest me at the time and um, I like chasing you know, rabbits down holes. So people I've worked with have had you know, biomedical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, chemistry, physics, any background that brings you the knowledge and the desire to work with people, you can transition across really easily. Um, it's the fundamental skills beneath you and the creativity and the willing to take some new crazy ideas on is really what gets you there. It's no particular background. But, you know, biomedical engineering, of course, is, is the best. Do we all have to be overachievers like you, Kate, to be successful in this? <laughs> That's not what my dad says. <laughs> 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 now, you've mentioned the crazy thinking. We're going to go back to our crazy thinking advocate, Vishal. Um, crazy and creative uh, solutions to future problems. Vishal, this question's for you. Uh, how can technology improve community well-being in health and social care? Oh, fantastic. Great question. Um, uh, so I think... Actually, before I answer that one, let me just say something about what Kate said, because I, I really just want to I really want to underscore what she said, because it's so right that um, uh, I think all of the most productive ideas right now that that I'm seeing, whether it's in my lab or the work of other great colleagues and friends across the university or indeed across the world, it's always people who are 
who are disrespectful of disciplinary boundaries. Like you got to chase the idea and you got to chase the impact no matter where it leads you. So you might start in economics or you might start in medicine and find yourself in sociology or you might find yourself in uh, um, in some weird far flung part uh, uh, of academia and I, or, or intellectual life. And I think that's the thing. If you have that curiosity and if you have that it's really courage to say, you know, I don't care if I'm going to be an expert in X area or Y area. I'm going to chase this idea and I'm going to nail it. I'm going to nail this rabbit down the hole or whatever. Kate to really, Kate, your surname's Fox. So the fox chases the rabbit down the hole. So I think actually um, that, that that kind of curiosity and that kind of courage is what is needed. And it's it's quite different than what um, the structure of a lot of our existing modern uh, ways of learning where you become a specialist and you become increasingly narrow over time we have to recapture something about the deep generalist or a person who's willing to kind of go across go, go sideways so i just like to say kate um you're a weirdo but we love you so it's great so um, um so that's really good uh, now how can technology help us to um connect across social and economic fabric was that the was that the question dean is that basically right absolutely Fantastic. So I think, you know, we have just engaged in the world's biggest um, experiment, haven't we, in respect of relying on technologies to cause us to connect, be it socially, be it economically, be it educationally. Never before, we have been held out the promise, I think, for many years by technology companies and technology advocates that technology can help us to connect in all kinds of ways and can help us to collaborate uh, at scale and at distance. Fantastic. We've been made that promise. And I think um, I think we've just tried to test that. We've tried to see, is that true? Can it deliver? Can technology deliver? And I think what we are learning is the sh yes and no. So yes, technology can allow us to connect in interesting ways, um, but there is something, once again, there's something irreducible about human connection and community level engagement that all the technology in all the world just can't duplicate. So I think in a sense, one of the things that we need to think about with technology is to just remember, re-remember re that it is a tool. It's a tool that's helping us do something. And that something is a innately human and communal activity. So we should use technology um, as we can to help us to connect when we can't leave our homes, to, um, to, to put around people who are in isolation in hospitals um, so that they can, they can be with their family even if they can't be with their family. For us to be able to learn but all, uh, um, in, in new ways and, and overcome the tyranny of distance, absolutely. But we have to design for well-being and for digital well-being and that's something that i think um that this grand experiment that we've just kind of undertaken is really pointing us towards we can do more to particularly if we want this to become a new way of living a new paradigm for working and engaging and connecting we have to do a lot more to bring those human factors of uh, 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 of come <laughs> not to sound too crazy but let me go let me uh, we of, of empathy uh, of, of compassion of human to human connection and care somehow we need to learn ways to design that into the heart to design the heart of our technological systems and our connective um, digital connective tissue it, it certainly is exciting times, would you say, Vishal? There's this opportunity really to engage with passion um, and using uh, technology um, and, and intellect to really design some fantastic solutions we may not have uh, considered in the past. And I think that that call to don't wait uh, for what's next, but actually make what's next and really engage in that. I think it's a really uh, important message. Okay, speaking of making things, we're going to go back to Kate, who likes to make things with diamonds. But Kate, the question from our listener is, um, what other weird and wonderful materials have uh, been used in bioengineering? Sure. So I, I guess the ones I can think of immediately is, I mean, obviously gold's had a pretty storied history in terms of being able to track um, the movement of things throughout the body, particularly when you're having um, scans and that sort of stuff. Um, selenium is now being used a lot for um, antimicrobial surfaces. So people are using selenium, which I, I, I'd never heard of until I sort of started digging deep in literature. 
I remember seeing it on a quiz show once of, you know, name elements ending with IUM. Um, another really cool one is people are looking now into magnesium for implants because magnesium based implants can dissolve inside the body. So they're pretty cool because you can use them in situations where you're trying to avoid that dreaded stress shielding that Milan referred to. So magnesium is probably the cool one at the moment. And they even put in copper inside the body where, you know, 20 years ago, if someone said the word copper and the word body, you all would have fallen off your chair. But they're now finding ways to alloy copper a bit better and make it a bit more biocompatible. So we may end up in a point in the future where our jewellery is actually worn on the inside. Well, we can only hope. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Okay, Vishal, back to you. Now, I think you mentioned this earlier, the, the Tune Chair. Um, how does it work and what's it all about? Fantastic, great. So the Tune Chair is a beautiful intervention. It was actually de designed by um, a, a fantastic uh, researcher here at RMIT, uh, who basically thought, hey, I love music. Um, I would love to program a virtual reality chair so that it moves to the music. And it, you know, it, it's extraordinarily fun. Um, but actually, one of the things that you realize quite quickly, and when, when we in the lab came across it, we thought, hang on a sec, you could use this for all kinds of amazing health uh, applications. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we know, for example, in dementia recovery and care, music is really important, movement is really important. And if you can manage to optimize the relationship of the music and the movement together, you can get really quite significant cognitive and health benefits. We pitched this uh, tune chair uh, into, the it won a, uh, into the Dementia Australia Decoding Dementia Innovation Challenge, and it won. Um, uh, and so, uh, and now it's being developed in in a bit more detail. But basically, it tries to marry movement music um, through this through a virtual reality chair um, to give a very different experience that has under the table a series of, under the table under the chair a series of really interesting health benefits as well. And that's just kind of that's one great example of where. Um, the, of, of something that we're really obsessive about in the lab, which is there are all kinds of unbelievable technological um, advancements and innovations and play things. Another one is drones, actually, drones for rehab that uh, we've been playing around with as well, where a, a technology designed for ostensibly another purpose can be put to work in a health context in a really, really interesting way. Tune chair is one. Um, drones are another. We have a digital wallpaper that can be used in similar kinds of ways. So it's about trying to find the, the next adjacent possibility and seeing what can be done with that. And I think that's the great, I mean, it's a little bit like um, what, what Kate was talking about as well in terms of, hey, diamond's cool and it does this cool stuff. What use can we put it to? Um, and it's that kind of, it's that kind of creativity and it's that kind of um, inquisitiveness and curiosity that I think is is so exciting um, um, for us at RMIT and, and and in this space generally. Fantastic, and as, Vishal, as you talk about the tune, ch tune chair, and as I think about uh, the last couple of weeks, we've, uh, many of us have been working remotely, and I know for one that I spend a lot more of my day now sitting uh, sedentary, and so the idea of having a chair which keeps me moving while I'm uh, sitting uh, could be a good thing. Um, totally. Which segues actually into the next question we have for Milan. Um, Milan, there have been a number or there have been various publications in medical journals um, where they predict an increase in the amount of hip and knee replacements at younger ages um, and all due to our sedentary and inactive lifestyle. Um, do you think this is still the case and what do you see emerging in the future? Yeah, um Look, um, that's not my area of expertise, Dean, I guess. Um, but certainly, I mean, I can comment that, uh, you know, we, we are, 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 I guess, children uh, these days, uh, they do lead more sort of sedentary lives uh, and they spend more time at home. And I think they should be really spending more time outside, um, you know, playing. Um, I mean the impact on their joints. Uh, you know that's 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 possible, but I guess there there could be other causes for uh, for 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 those uh, observations. 
right? So my, I guess my advice would be, yes, send your kids outside to play, you know, not not just spend time inside on a on a whatever, you know, laptop or a, or an iPad or something. I mean, the kids need to be outside and, and uh, move their joints, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Milan. Good advice. Hey, keep active, folks. Keep active. OK, <laughs> one last question before we call this to a close. This one, we come back to Kate and Kate with your obsession <laughs> around diamonds, a healthy obsession, I should say. Um, but the question is, um, do you buy the diamonds that you use in your research? Um, but, but also, are they synthetic or natural diamonds? Sure. So it depends on the application, to be honest. Um, do you know that if you light your birthday candles on your cake and you seal that flickering in the air? That's actually little tiny diamonds being formed by the candles. Anyway, but yeah, at the moment we buy um, synthetic diamonds and if we want it for medical applications where it's going to be large upscaled use, we just buy the detonation nano diamonds and then we put it in a giant microwave and it's able to form um, large scale diamonds. If we want it for things like um, biosensing or quantum computing, then we use the, the much higher purity diamonds because they're easier to sort of stimulate with, with laser light and detect from. So it depends on the application. Fantastic, thank you, Kate. <laughs> uh, we're going to end up with one last question for the panel uh, without notice. Um, and I'm really interested to just uh, get you each to respond. I'm going to start with Kate. Um, what are you most excited about, about the future of technology and health and social care? Starting with you, Kate, then to Milan, and we'll finish up with Vishal. So I, mean, I can't predict what's going to happen. That's the most exciting part. If you told me 20 years ago that 3D printing would be a thing, that we'd all be designing things on computers, I would have laughed at you. We didn't even have internet at high school. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the whole core of the thing in engineering is that we don't know what's coming next. We don't know the solutions that we need to solve. Um, so I don't know. I, I think the, the bionic man, the, the more merge between man and machine, but then oh, that, that brings in the ethics problems and that sort of stuff, but it's all exciting. Uh, so Steve Austin could be making a return. Thank you very much. Kate, Milan, what are you most excited about in the terms of the future of technology, health and social care? Uh, look, I'm very, uh, like Kate, it's difficult to predict. And, and you know, really 10 years ago, I mean, the 3D printing was was very, very rudimentary. But, you know, look look where it is now and, and, and what's, what's happening in that space. So in terms of the bio... I, I, I think we ha we haven't yet invented or, or developed the new technology that will help people, um, uh, whether it's in you know surgery or or other aspects of of, of human health. So, but I'm very very optimistic um, in, in that space. Fantastic, thank you, Milan and Vishal. Last word from you. What are you most excited about moving forward for the future of tech and health and social care? Fantastic. So I think what's most exciting is that it's the, uh, about the future of tech uh, in our areas is that it's actually not going to be driven by technologists, I think, or just technologists. That's what I think is so cool. I think that we're coming back to a realization, perhaps that we we had um, well, a, lo a long time ago, you know, like a, a hundred years ago, where we recognize that every technological intervention was, there's no such thing as a pure tech intervention. There's all, it's always socio-technological. It always involves people and communities and societies and values and ethics. And I think that what's so exciting is that's the realization that we are again coming to um, and that's getting a new kind of mainstream thinking. So. Um, it means that I will, as a as an economist, a lawyer, and a social theorist, be in a conversation with Kate as an engineer and 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 Milan as a technologist in a in a really kind of interesting and productive way. That again, twenty years ago, those guys wouldn't have talked to me at all. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, maybe they would because I'm charming. But apart from that, they probably wouldn't have that that many opportunities to you know we wouldn't have that many opportunities to talk to each other and to design and think together. Together. And that's not what the future is going to be for us. And that's what I think is exciting. Fantastic. Thank you. So you say 20 years ago, about five years ago, when they would have chatted with you. I don't know, but you are charming. I'll give you that. Um, thank you to everybody who's been listening in today. Um, if your question couldn't be answered, we are sorry, but please feel free to email it through. Uh, you can email your questions to campaigns at rmit.edu.au um, and we'll try to respond to you as soon as possible. Uh, so to, uh, to 
to uh, close it up. Thank you, Vishal, for your little note. Um, uh, a very big thank you to Vishal, to Milan and to Kate, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, Technology Matters, the Future of Health and Social Care. Thank you.